thank you all for coming today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Delia West, and I'm the director of Tech Health, who's bringing you today's presentation in conjunction with the Cancer Prevention and Control Program. And I have great pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Beth Sundstrom. She is in the Department of Communication at the College of Charleston. I gotta read all this so I get it right. Okay. She received her bachelor's in political science from Tulane University and then went on to obtain her MPH at Brown University, specializing in health communication and women's health. Kind of makes sense, right, for what she's talking about today. She then went on to receive her PhD in communication from the University of Maryland College Park. Her research interests include strategic health communication, social marketing, and women's health. <coughs> She's interested in multiple methods, calls herself a multiple methods researcher, <coughs> experience in survey design, as well as qualitative methods. And much of her research, at least the research that I'm aware of and super interested in, is this intersection between theory and practice, in particular looking as how it relates to digital media and communication and diffusion and innovations over time. Fair description? Yeah, kind of well, I have a lucky experience of getting to first meet her in uh, as a collaborator in a project that was looking at two technology-driven health promotion programs for college students, which we did in conjunction with our health communications classes, which was a really cool way of being able to deliver an intervention and also get feedback on it from the target population overall. So it's been a source of continuing collaboration and not with continuing research activities. She's gonna talk with us today about some of the material that she has published fairly recently in a newly released book, which is entitled Reproductive Justice and Women's Voices, Health Communication Across the Lifespan. Please join me in welcoming that sunshine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. And wow, look at this crowd. Uh, what an involved group. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. So I am going to talk today about women's health and the digital age. And my book, as well as my research agenda overall, uh, contributes to recent efforts to develop a life course perspective to address women's health. And so my book is sort of going to serve as a blueprint for my talk today. And so I want to talk about these four critical body episodes that I look at in my book and I research in my research agenda. So this includes contraceptive use dynamics, pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. And these body episodes really serve as a lens to examine win women's understanding of control and embodiment in the context of technology. And from a practical perspective, women make really important and complex decisions during these body episodes that offer opportunities for empowerment for health educators and health communicators. So I'm going to talk specifically about how women understand or make meaning in three areas. The physiological experience of reproductive health, perceptions of medicine and the biomedical model, and perceptions of mediated messages about reproduction, including digital media. And so my focus in today's presentation is really on that digital aspect, e-health, m-health, or mobile health, um, and how these messages impact women's health. I don't want to give you an extensive literature review, but I just want to tell you a little bit about where my research is grounded, my foundations for this work. According to the United Nations and the World Health Organization, reproductive rights are human rights. And so I look at this work through a reproductive justice lens. So what this means is that individuals have the right to decide if, when, and how to have children, as well as how to raise them. And it's about more than simply choice. It's also about access, because without access, there can be no real choice. And so we need to look at this in a social context that acknowledges inequalities of wealth and power. 
and I really align with uh, Donna Haraway's feminist science or cyborg feminist perspective, uh, looking at how we can break free from the nature culture duality and how these bonds um, constrain us uh, and how we can really move past that to employ science and technology to improve women's health. And then intersectionality, or as bell hooks would say, how sex, race, and class intersect in complicated ways connects very closely to reproductive justice. But I also come from a very uh, public health perspective, from a patient-centered public health perspective. And so there is a growing body of literature emphasizing patient-centered public health by analyzing women's reproductive health across the lifespan using this culture-centered approach. And what this means is looking at medicalization or how medicalization and the biomedical model may pathologize women's bodies looking at natural processes such as pregnancy as illness. And this marginalization um, might actually trigger an identity struggle. Uh, and so I look at that through a, a health communication perspective. And by health communication, um, I think it's, it's central to the interweaving of body, mind, and society. And one of my favorite definitions from Klein is that health communication is about both formal and informal communication. It is intended and spontaneous, and it is a matrix of mediated and interpersonal messages. So that is really the lens that I take. Um, I also look at social marketing, or the use of marketing techniques to achieve social change. And communicating risk, risk is really essential in this work, um, especially when you look at cancer screening, when you look at vaccination, um, something that I'm gonna come back to at the end of this talk and what we're doing now, um, communicating risk is central to consumer-oriented, informed decision-making in all areas of medicine and treatment. Um, and I'm really happy to talk about any of these concepts or especially answer questions about method. Uh, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that in this talk, but really please write down any questions. I'm so happy to, to engage with you on these, on these ideas. So I'm gonna tell you about my research from my book, but this research has extended, and so, um, but I just wanna limit it for the purpose of this talk to uh, conversations that I had with women between 2010 and 2012, uh, which I talked with 81 women who were at sort of the, these critical body episode time periods. So college women I talked with about contraceptive use dynamics, I talked with pregnant women, and I talked with mothers of newborns who had just had a childbirth experience and were currently in the postpartum period. So I used this purposive sampling and I attempted to achieve theoretical saturation of the concepts that I was exploring, uh, and I used a constant comparative analytical approach and hyper-research analysis software to assist with the coding and analysis. Just to give you a brief sense of the demographics, uh, 22 participants identified as women of color and 59 identified as, as white women. So what did I find? Uh, what can I tell you, hopefully that is new and interesting, um, about how women perceive their health in the digital age? So in terms of contraceptive use decision making, uh, we know, you know the United Nations described family planning as a universal human right, um, but currently in the United States, over 50% of pregnancies are unintended. In South Carolina, that's 56%. Um, and Healthy People 2020, as you know, provides evidence-based national benchmarks to improve the health and well-being of women, infants, children, and families. And so those guideposts uh, hope to increase intended pregnancies to 56% by 2020. And the family planning objectives uh, include increasing the proportion of pregnancies that are intended, and improving access and use of highly effective contraception. Now, support for contraception is truly universal in the United States, and more than 99% of women who have ever had sexual intercourse have used at least one contraceptive method. And that is true across all religious denominations. So we have universal support for contraception, um, and approximately 55 million women with private health insurance have benefited from the Affordable Care Act, uh, which includes women's preventive health services, including all FDA-approved methods of contraception. Uh, 
Now, we know that despite the guarantee of these benefits, it has not been perfect, uh, and recent studies have shown widespread violations of these rules by um, health insurance companies, as well as women who are in grandfathered plans, for example. So it's not perfect, but the support is there. We have the Affordable Care Act that is truly making a difference, and the National Women's Law Center and their coverher.org um, is helping women who are, are unable to access contraception um, through their insurance companies. So coverher.org uh, is a great resource. So we have the support. So what's, what's the problem, right? Why are 50% of pregnancies still unintended? Well, uh, a woman has been estimated that if she wants two children, she has to ha use contraception for 30 years. So that is a really long time to be considering and concerned about contraception. And studies have shown a pattern across women's lifespan where they start out using condoms, then they use the pill, uh, and finally when they're done having their desired number of children, they move on to steriliz sterilization. So why isn't this working? Um, well, so many women rely on condoms and the pill as their main methods of birth control. In fact, four out of five women who have ever had sexual intercourse have taken the pill. So it is ubiquitous. And overall, um, among women ages 20 to 24, 73% of pregnancies are unintended. So a, a big jump from the, the overall rate. And my research shows that college women in particular associate contraception with the pill. That is the social norm. And women I talked with linked the popularity of the pill to its effectiveness. So you can see in this quote, um, you know, women assumed that the pill was 99% effective, and they assumed that because everyone's taking it. It must be, it must be the, the most effective. Um, so, oh. My video is not going to play. Uh, so the, the pill is uh, only 91% effective, uh, and the male condom is 82% effective. And I show a video here from friends. Uh, maybe some of you will remember it, when Ross and Rachel get pregnant, uh, even though they used a condom. And so he says, you know, they should put that on the box, that it's not 100% effective. Uh, and he goes on to say that he is an indignant consumer because <laughs> How could they get pregnant while being while using a condom, right? They did the right thing and they still got pregnant. Um, and really that is the reaction of women that I talk to when they find out that the pill is only 91% effective um, because they are indignant as consumers. Uh, they are shocked by this statistic uh, and they want to know why no one has ever told them this before. So uh, with, with all these women relying on the pill and the pill not being as effective as people think it is, um, most people would tell you or that I talked to you say that the pill is 99% or 100% effective. So where do we go from there? Well, um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2012 recommended long-acting reversible contraception or uh, the IUD and the implant, sometimes called highly effective uh, contraception, as the first line contraceptive option for all women, uh, including young women and adolescents. Uh, and the American Academy of Pediatrics followed suit in 2014. So these are safe, easy, and more effective options. Uh, in our country, of course, we have the history of the Dalcon Shield, which in the 1970s was a failed IUD that caused um, uh, increased risk of pelvic infection and infertility. But recent studies have shown that comparing women who use IUDs and women who use all other types of contraception, there is no increased risk of pelvic infection or infertility between those two groups. So um, although, you know, there is still an, uh, some risk associated with the IUD, that risk is rare and these are safe uh, methods. However, as you can see by this quote, uh, there is still social stigma against these methods. Um, if, this quote says that if a girl uses the IUD, she might be promiscuous. Um, so people associate these methods as something uh, outside the norm. 
And so why is that in the context of my findings? Well, first of all, what I call sort of the myth of perfect use, when you talk with women, uh, they say that they are responsible enough to take the pill every day. They want to be in control uh, by taking a pill every day. Um, however, every woman I talked to had a story of missing the pill, um, whether it was for finals week or going on vacation. Um, everyone had that story, and many women had a story of someone they knew who got pregnant while on the pill. So the, the pill is something that women believe that they can be in control of, and that's important to them. They believe they are diligent and responsible enough to take that every day. And so that's some of the reason that there is resistance against the, the IUD and the implant. Um, also, they, uh, there's limited knowledge of just how different the effectiveness can be. So the IUD and the implant are over 99% effective. They're the most effective reversible contraceptive option. Um, and also this idea of health uncertainty. So women want to know how these methods will impact their fertility and also their um, monthly period. So participants in my study and women I've talked with desire a natural cycle, but with moderation. 73% of women have altered their cycle by missing or skipping a pill-free week. And research shows that there is no need, there's no medical reason for women to have a monthly pill-free interval. Um, and this withdrawal bleeding, which is, which is caused by that pill-free inter interval, is not a real period. So even though women say that they are reassured by getting their period every month, they know they're not pregnant, um, they can still be pregnant. And it's, it's interesting when you look at the life course approach to see how this notion comes back uh, to some of the media messages in in shows like you, I Didn't Know I Was Pregnant, where women who didn't know they were pregnant because they were getting this withdrawal bleeding, uh, and so went the whole nine months and then you know end up delivering on a boat or, or things like this. Uh, and so some of those media messages come back when we talk about pregnant women. Um, but a, Co a Cochrane database systematic review supports the safety of continuous use of hormonal contraception. It increases compliance, it improves satisfaction, it reduces um, PMS, it reduces men menstrual symptoms, um, and so there, there's a lot of good to be said for menstrual suppression, and it's safe. Um, so Macklem Gladwell in this article in The New Yorker really popularized this idea that anthropologists have been talking about for a long time, um, particularly Beverly Strassman, talks about how in a pre-industrial society, women would be pregnant or experiencing lactational amenorrhea for most of their reproductive life, leading to only about 100 periods in their lifetime. But today, an average American woman um, might have a period 350 to 400 times in her life. So that's a big, big difference. And some scholars have actually suggested that this, what they call incessant menstruation, may increase clinical disorders such as anemia, endometriosis, and even um, PMS. So um, what do we need to know about the benefits of contraception? Uh, well, uh, hormonal contraception treats or prevents a host of conditions uh, from heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, painful periods, acne, all the way to colon, ovarian, and endometrial cancer. So we have a lot of benefits. So what are the messages that are out there? Well, a lot of them are actually pretty scary. And you might attribute this to the boom and bust phenomenon where a new method hits the market, there are some horror stories, and then it, go, it, it goes away. People, women discontinue using these methods. But contraceptive scare is a real thing. And it's a result of negative media publicity, which may cause women to discontinue their method. It has impacted how women perceive hormonal contraception and the risk of adverse health effects. In particular, what's important to note is that narratives in the media tend to downplay the risk of pregnancy and childbirth as a natural um, process, something that you know is, is something we should all want to do and something that is healthy. And while that's true, um, it, what happens with contraception is the exact opposite. Uh, there are highly publicized reports of contraceptive-related complications. And so we have uh, really, instead of comparing contraception to the risks of pregnancy and childbirth, um, we're, not, we're not doing that. So studies show that the use of any method of contraception prevents more deaths from pregnancy and childbirth than are associated with method use.
So in other words, any risks associated with contraceptive methods should be compared with the risks of pregnancy and childbirth. As this statistic shows, for young, healthy non-smokers using hormonal contraception, the risk of death is 240 times lower than the risk of death related to pregnancy complications. And what I find fascinating is that recently, a number of really large cohort studies have shown reduced rates of cancer among women who had ever used hormonal contraception and lower overall risk of death among current and past users of hormonal contraception compared with non-users. In other words, hormonal contraception offers a net health benefit to users in addition to pregnancy prevention. Um, and the best source for all of this information is Dr. Bob Thatcher, who is one of the co-authors of Contraceptive Technology, sort of the seminal book for OBGYNs uh, in terms of contraceptive use. So women are, um, you know, really overwhelmed by the contraceptive scare messages. Uh, this quote you can see, uh, I talked to my mom and she said the IUD was terrifying and unnecessary. So women overwhelmingly get messages from their friends, from their family, uh, and only then do they go online, they Google it. And uh, they oftentimes read sort of the, the contraceptive scare messages, the highly publicized reports of contraceptive-related complications. So what do we do about that? Um, well, I think that the takeaway message is that we need to emphasize as health communicators the safety of continuous use and menstrual suppression, the decreased risk of certain cancers and improved fertility, the non-contraceptive benefits, and conceptualize the, the risks outside of the normative natural processes of menstruation, pregnancy, and childbirth. And some of this has been done. Uh, in 2011, the Ad Council partnered with the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, and they created the first national multimedia public service campaign, bedsider.org. Uh, and they conceived this as a birth control support network that talks about all methods, but really recommends the IUD and the implant as the primary methods. So moving on to pregnancy, I know this is a whirlwind tour of women's reproductive health, um, but hopefully you'll see how uh, these body episodes and the decision making uh, that women have related to them um, all come together. And so women's reproductive health focuses on this triad of gendered identity, so looking at body, sexuality, and otherness. And in particular, the discussion of the body as more than the sum of its parts can be applied to the medicalization and pathologizing of women's bodies. And when I was first sort of coming to terms with this notion or grappling with it and trying to understand it, this graphic illustration by William Hunter uh, really helped me to, to, put, uh, to put this in terms that I could understand. Because here is depicted a pregnant woman and a fetus uh, that really shows to me in a nutshell the medicalization of pregnancy. So he is displaying the pregnant woman as simply a uterus. Uh, and so the illustration suggests that the woman is not more than the sum of her parts. In fact, the body is essentialized and broken down to its component parts. And so when we think about this identity, I think it's important to think about it in what we just talked about. Women spend 30 years uh, preventing pregnancy and having these empowering messages of control and how you can control your body. And then, you know, women become pregnant or they decide they want to become pregnant. And then what happens? Well, I found that women perceive pregnancy as a surprise, and there is a spectrum of intended pregnancy. Um, some women describe that they stopped preventing pregnancy. Some women say they're trying. Many women track their fertile periods. Uh, they use mobile apps. They use ovulation predictor kits, or they use drugs like Clomid uh, to induce ovulation or in vitro fertilization. But this is truly a prosumption of pregnancy where the women are both consuming and producing the pregnancy. Um, this is often the first time women are using mobile apps, for example, to track their period. Um, they are buying ovulation predictor kits. They are obviously buying pregnancy tests. So they are really prosuming this experience of pregnancy. 
And what I found was that despite all of this planning and all of this money and all of the resources and time uh, spent in, in preparing to be pregnant, women were still surprised by it. And I think this is a common trope that you might see in popular culture. So if you think of anyone in here ever see Sex in the City, anyone willing to admit they, <laughs> that they ever watch it? Um, so if you think about Sex in the City, one of the characters, Charlotte, uh, was diagnosed uh, with infertility and she couldn't get pregnant after trying uh, IVF multiple times. The, her and her husband finally adopt a baby and then lo and behold, she gets pregnant, right? And so this is a common trope that we see a lot of times with um, with TV and movies, celebrities uh, perpetuate this as well. And so when you talk with real women, the next time you have a chance, uh, ask them about you know, how they feel about being pregnant, and I guarantee they will include some form of surprise or shock. Uh, and why is that? Well. Um, you know, part of the reason I think is that surprise is commonly understood as sort of a sudden or unexpected event, but it also can be defined as an event that occurs when something passes from one state to another. Uh, pregnancy can be defined as a temporary state or transition uh, from woman to mother. And so uh, pregnancy as surprise uh, really applies in all, sorts of, in all sorts of situations, whether uh, women were trying with IVF for multiple years, they were still surprised. Uh, or whether women stopped trying and the first month they got pregnant and they were really surprised. Um, so pregnancy as a surprise uh, was something really linked, especially to, I think, this digital culture, the mobile apps and all of the, um, you know, the access to these tools to um, track and predict pregnancy. Uh, also, uh, of course, pregnancy is a secret, right? There's a social norm in our culture to hide pregnancy until the 12th week. And uh, participants believe that this really stigmatized miscarriage in particular. 31% of pregnancies end in miscarriage, so it's a pretty common event, and yet not something that's talked about very much. And this is related to social norms around medicalization and secrecy. It was really interesting, um, one of the participants I talked to, uh, you know, how they, they talked about pregnancy as a secret, who they're going to tell, their husband, their friends, uh, and one interview that really stood out to me was uh, a woman who told me that the first person she told she was pregnant was the Borders checkout guy because she went to buy a book on pregnancy. <laughs> so, you know, thinking about your own life, you know, who, you know, who can you divulge this information to? You just want to tell someone and yet there is this social norm and stigma. Uh, to be silent and not to tell, not to talk about it. And this leads into the idea of maternal fetal conflict, which, which feminists describe as the ways in which law and social practices and, and medicine um, sometimes treat a pregnant woman her interests in opposition to the fetus that she's carrying. Um, so this came up a lot in terms of recommendations and doctor's recommendations. In this quote, um, this woman was European and she was going to have a glass of wine no matter what her doctor recommended. Uh, and so women that I talked with resisted medical advice and what I've termed the purest pregnant woman myth in favor of shared decision making. So these women wanted to know why they needed blood work and genetic testing and glucose tests why they had to avoid alcohol or exercising, and why they needed ultrasounds. And I think, um, you know, it really is about shared decision making. So uh, if, a, if a doctor said, you know, it's okay, you know, let's talk about alcohol, they would be much more amenable to that versus just sort of a blanket um, prohibition of it. And so um, women need better information about the harms and benefits because there are so many things that women are told during pregnancy they should or should not do. Um, and not all of it is necessarily the right information. So the US Preventive Task Force actually recommends against routine ultrasounds in low-risk pregnancies. Is that new information to anyone here? Anyone surprised by that? <laughs> a couple people. Um, so, you know, in pregnancy, I think you would, the doctor would look at you cross-eyed if you, if you turn down ultrasounds. That is just such a normal part of obstetric practice. But um, they, they, they do not uh, reduce adverse outcomes and may actually increase cesarean sections. Also, I added this in because uh, you may have heard recently the CDC came out and recommended that all women of reproductive age who are not on birth control should stop drinking alcohol. So that was very 
very practical recommendation, right? <laughs> um, and so the CDC, although of course um, I love the CDC and I think that they um, do wonderful things, uh, some of their campaigns around preconception care and folic acid and telling women not to drink alcohol, um, all women of reproductive age, is it can be dangerous um, because instead of targeting women who want to be pregnant or plan to become pregnant, um, they really reduce women to that biological reproductive function. And so the campaigns are not actually about women's reproductive health. They're about preventing, you know, in terms of folic acid, preventing neural tube defects in potential fetuses. Um, and so what I think is dangerous about that is that it reduces women to that biological role, um, even though those are really important campaigns and really important information. Um, and you can see with the backlash against the drinking alcohol how that's not an effective message for women. So how are women pursuing pregnancy, especially in the digital age? Well, um, I think maybe five or ten years ago, every woman would have had a copy of what to expect when you're expecting. Today, they have the app of what to expect when you're expecting. Uh, every participant I talked with is on babycenter.com. Um, and many participants are on Text for Baby. So if you're not familiar with Text for Baby, it's the first national health texting campaign. It's completely free to the recipient. Um, and they uh, had a partnership with all of the cell phone um, providers so that women could get these text messages for free. They're now almost uh, reaching a million women. And they provide timely advice uh, and information. So um, I, I remember one statistic, one fact uh, was that a woman got into the car and she was seven months pregnant and she didn't know how to put her seatbelt on. And then literally at that moment, Text for Baby sent a text um, about how to put her seatbelt on. Uh, and so these are timed messages you put in your due date. And so they're messages that are timed, hopefully exactly at the moment that you need them at the point of decision making. Um, and they provide resources as well as education and information and they continue throughout the baby's first year uh, connecting women to those resources. Um, online communities, many women for the first time during pregnancy participated in online communities or blogs. Th that is where they wanted to find their information from other women who were experiencing similar things. Uh, also, social media, Facebook in particular. And one of the stories I love to tell is about um, a woman who met a group on babycenter.com based on her due date. And because of the silence around telling people you're pregnant, you know, she was eight weeks pregnant and she just couldn't bear to keep that secret in one more minute. So she went on Baby Center to find a group of women who were also eight weeks pregnant. And these women formed a connection so much that they wanted a group where they could talk. And they created a Facebook group and they kept it private. And they wanted to make sure that their friends didn't know what this group was about. And so they called it I Love Shoes. <laughs> so if their friends saw the group, they wouldn't know what it was about. But it was really important for them to have an opportunity to talk with one another and to share what was going on with them uh, at such a timely, in such a timely way. So they could talk with someone who was also eight weeks pregnant and then nine weeks and then nine months and um, then later on talking about the delivery. And uh, these women I talked with in the postpartum period were still part of this group. And so this is sometimes the first time women are engaging in some of these new media technologies, but they, it's not the last time. This is an opportunity to reach them uh, that they may never have been on before, and then they continue using these resources. And they use apps not only um, for conception, as I mentioned, but throughout pregnancy. This is a screenshot of the What to Expect app. Um, and you know they love to compare the size of babies to fruit, right? Like limes and lima beans and um, all those kinds of things, but just timely information. And then also during labor, so contraction apps, keeping track of their contractions. Uh, and then also throughout delivery and beyond. So this is especially helpful, as described in this quote, for women who don't have close family members. Um, they found an app because they, it was helpful because it was confidential, and it made everything really easy and clear. 
So women make it through pregnancy, um, and they've been told their whole lives to control their bodies through um, being responsible, uh, and then they get to childbirth. And this is really where we start to see the intersection of maternal and child health. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has priority future research needs, including improving risk communication and decision making in childbirth. And Healthy People 2020 includes reducing uh, cesarean births among, among low risk women. So childbirth is an important experience to women, and um, when the cesarean delivery rate was first measured in 1965, the U.S. rate was 4.5%. Today, it is over 30%, and this really has, bears a burden on women and infants, as well as the U.S. healthcare system. In, in the year 1900, almost all births occurred at home, um, many with a trained midwife. By 1969, only 1% of births took place at home. And it, as late as the 1930s, home births with trained midwives were safer than hospital deliveries by physicians. Uh, and some people, you know, scholars will say, you know, that this was just a natural progression of medicine. Um, but it's really interesting if you look at the literature um, and, and you see uh, sort of where this has, has come from, uh, in the late 19th century, they actually uh, talked in writing about solutions to the, quote, midwife problem, uh, where private practitioners and academic obstetricians wanted midwives out. Um, they wanted them to be eliminated as soon as possible, or if not, then brought under the control of doctors. And so I think this quote by this Kansas doctor um, back in the late 19th century, uh, cited by Levitt in 1997, but he, this Kansas doctor said, perhaps the best way to manage normal labor is to let it alone, but you cannot hold it down a job and do that. So there really was sort of a systematic uh, move from home births uh, with midwives to the hospital birth. And so from a feminist perspective, the hospital birth really marginalized women's bodily experiences by privileging medical authority. Um, of course, the history of that is women were completely knocked out for a period, uh, and that impacts today, you know, trying to talk to your grandmother about their birth. They don't, may not remember anything. Um, so this is, this is impacting us even today. I will say that black midwives really held out the longest, especially here in South Carolina, um, and they were highly prestigious members of the rural communities they served as respected healthcare experts, um, and in, in a really important part of cultural transmission and community leadership, and a lot of good work is going on in South Carolina to, um, to, to keep that material culture uh, and to remember the really important role. So this speaks to, you know, the need to um, prevent the first cesarean delivery. Uh, and women that I talked with, you know, felt very strongly about whether they wanted or did not want a C-section. And um, the national cesarean delivery rate of over 30% may be attributed to the increase in interventions. Um, for almost 60 years, a normal labor and delivery has been defined by Friedman's curve, and that is a description of the length of time 500 first-time mothers giving birth in 1954 were required to dilate during labor. So some scholars have su suggested that this is an obsolete measurement that may increase the diagnosis of failure to progress and may lead to more interventions, including C-sections. In March 2014, ACOG and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine issued a consensus statement on the safe prevention of the primary cesarean delivery. So they had this joint statement that they came together and said, we really need to do something about this problem. And Healthy People aims to reduce cesarean birth among low-risk women by 20, to 23.9% by 2020. So everyone agrees that this is a problem. And talking to women, we, we find that part of the reason is that they're not well informed about the need for interventions. So they don't have information on the harms and benefits of things that may uh, increase the potential for cesarean delivery, like labor induction, such as using Pitocin, or anesthesia, um, or continuous electronic fetal monitoring, for example. 
So women need better information about these interventions. And the World Health Organization uh, has come up with a plan to, to help do that. Um, yes, yeah, so this quote is, you know, the, this was so common, you know, this idea of telling women not, not to push. Um, and so the World Health Organization has said, you know, we need to let women um, have control over this experience. And so this physiological birth um, includes avoiding medically unnecessary labor induction, allowing freedom, freedom of movement during labor, continuous labor support, and avoiding routine interventions. So research shows that um, Interventions during childbirth, such as labor augmentation and cesarean delivery, lead to maternal dissatisfaction, and that women lack adequate information about the harms and benefits of these routine interventions, and that if we can increase their knowledge uh, during labor and delivery, it can improve their ability to make their own decisions. Now, you may know that the use of birth plans has really gone by the wayside. Women are no longer attending health education classes um, in large numbers, and part of that is cutbacks at hospitals that used to offer education for free, and now people have to pay. Um, and, and so what can we do about that? Well, um, I think that women's health in the digital age, I would make a case for digital, um, if not birth plan per se, uh, information. Because women are, are accessing these apps, they're accessing this, me this media. Um, not only a contraction app uh, where doctors may tell them, can you stop with the phone? <laughs> um, but Facebook, you know, using it to get support during labor. So women are on these media, and if we can access uh, them with the right information at the right time, I think we have an opportunity to make a big difference. Uh, women also are getting some not great information or even scary information, connecting that back to contraceptive scare. Now during pregnancy, women are scared by stories like a baby story, one born every minute, and especially I didn't know I was pregnant, um, which shares lots of stories of women who didn't know they were pregnant and then went into labor in various very uh, uncomfortable situations. So some women really um, resisted some of this mass media uh, because they said you know, it, it made them fearful um, of negative outcomes, instead preferring media that they could personalize. So really going to those blogs, those community forums where they could get the information they need, and apps, right? This idea that there's an app for that, that's really what women think. You know, I can get an app specifically for what I want and what I need. And so finally, um, talking about what happens next, the postpartum period, um, here is where we see uh, women, you know, continuing the use of apps. They may use apps for the first time during pregnancy, but they continue to use them throughout childbirth and the postpartum period. Um, and women, you know, talking about really trying to take it easy instead of trying to be superwoman. So really having an innate understanding that they need to take care of themselves in order to take care of their infant. Um, but at the same time, you know, not always being able to do that as women are often the primary caregiver and sacrifice their own health uh, for the health of those around them. Many women I talked to, their number one priority health issue was diet, uh, and they called it a constant conversation among women, especially in the postpartum period. And so some of the advice that doctors gave them, uh, for example, you know, waiting to exercise uh, was, not, was not taken very well. Um, they resisted this biomedical paradigm. Instead, they wanted to listen to their body. They questioned medical recommendations and really valued storytelling and personal narrative as a form of expertise. So um, for better or worse, you know, women are getting information online. They're getting information um, from other women. Um, and one of the, the biggest issues that came up, I, I was, I'm not a breastfeeding expert and I was not expecting to talk about breastfeeding. Um, maybe that was naive uh, going into these interviews in 2010, but the, what really surprised me was um, infant feeding. And so we actually found that there were five approaches to feeding infants, uh, breastfeeding, breastfeeding and pumping, pumping only, and these women in the popular culture gave themselves a name called PO moms or pump only moms. 
and formed a community around that. Uh, supplementing breast milk with formula and formula only. And these were all, you know, just such complex and nuanced decisions. And I will tell you that, you know, I talked with and have at this point talked with hundreds of women and we've talked about some hard things. Some of these women, you know, that I talked with had MS and were, you know, talking about how to, to deal with MS or they had seizures or they had experienced loss. Um, and so there were hard things that came up in the interviews. but. The only time people cried was when they talked about breastfeeding. And so to me, that was really shocking. You know, I was traditionally trained in public health, and so, you know, to me, it was just breast is best. That's just sort of what I thought about breastfeeding um, until I did these interviews. And I said, you know, there is sort of a really robust um, way approach, there are really different ways that people go about feeding um, their infants. And so to me, uh, it, it, it really spoke to the unintended consequences of health campaigns and health communication. And scholars have shown that, you know, at this point, um, breast or bottle feeding or using formula has really become a mark of bad motherhood. Uh, and that, you know, where we go from here is that we need to, to think about, um, the legitimate concerns that women may have about their body and about autonomy when they make the decision uh, to pump only, for example, or to, or to use formula only. And so um, I think that you know, these findings really reinforce the importance of understanding those unintended consequences and for healthcare providers in particularly to support women um, no, matter, no matter what approach they're taking. Um, anyone, anyone watch Call the Midwife? Uh, so this fits in perfectly with the latest episode of Call the Midwife. Um, when I saw it, I said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and basically, that episode dealt with the social stigma and guilt um, around breastfeeding, you know, and, and, and the impact that can, ha that can have on new mothers in particular. And so I think it's important to, to think about that as health communicators, that these media messages are, are out there. Um, they're on traditional media and social media, and they are causing extensive guilt among women. Um, and really, we need to encourage women that, you know, these approaches to feeding are all valid um, and, and all, there's a time and a place for all of them. So to wrap up my book and tell you what's, what I'm doing now, um, hopefully I have, I've been able to share with you some narratives that offer different ways of understanding the lived experiences of these women, um, hopefully challenging some con conventional representations and prevailing assumptions. Um, and really in summary, women deserve better information about the risks and benefits of medicine and healthcare. And ideally, if we can conceptualize these risks outside of the normative natural process, processes of menstruation, pregnancy, and childbirth, um, these messages will really be, be more um, impactful for women and help them to access services and technology. And so I really end the book talking about what's next. You know, uh, over-the-counter contraception is gaining momentum, uh, telehealth, contraception prescriptions, uh, egg freezing parties you may have read about uh, caused quite a stir, especially when the big technology companies such as Apple uh, create covered egg freezing um, as, as a, as a um, benefit in their health insurance plans. And some feminists actually opposed that and they said that's you know, telling women they need to wait to have kids. Um, but the Center for Reproductive Rights says that all women have the right to benefit from scientific progress. And so reproductive technologies, whether that's contraception, whether that's egg freezing, in vitro fertilization, or surrogacy, have the opportunity to improve women's lives and reproductive health. And so I think I hopefully end on a positive note that there is really an opportunity here um, for new kinds of unity across race, class, and gender, um, for women to embrace the possibility of science and technology. And of course, that includes digital media and digital health. And so, um, you know, the so what of this is, okay, so you did all of this research, how, you know, how are you really helping people? And one of the ways is that we're taking this research um, on health communication and risk communication um, to impact and hopefully increase awareness of HPV vaccination screening and treatment. Um, and so we did formative audience research among young women uh, just 
uh, and found sort of many along the, the same themes that I've discussed today uh, and created a multimedia pilot campaign that included social media. Um, so we implemented and evaluated the campaign and we won the multimedia award at APHA in 2014. Um, so we said, hey, we, we have something here. Um, this has been recognized by our colleagues. Uh, we have some potential to make a difference through this pilot health communication campaign. And so that's when we got hooked up um, with Tech Health and uh, the Healthy You Project. And so we recently uh, completed a controlled study of a technology-mediated behavioral intervention for college students. And we randomized undergraduates in two sections of a health communication course uh, for HPV vaccination awareness and behavioral weight gain prevention as sort of our case control. And they received eight lessons via e-newsletter and Facebook. And uh, at the end, we found that 79% recommend, would recommend Healthy You to a Friend, 85% thought the program was helpful, and 93 and 91% of the students opened the newsletter every week. Uh, in healthy weight, uh, students significantly increased their healthy weight control strategies. Um, including increasing self-weighing, exercise, and decreasing fat intake. And on the HPV side, 79% strongly agreed that vaccine to prevent HPV was a good idea. And we had great um, knowledge increase. So just for an example, at follow-up, when asked can HPV um, cause oral cancer, we had a 27% increase overall. So, and I'm being a little coy because we're still in the publication stage. So I didn't want to give too much away for the, for the results. But basically, um, you know, this research, my research line uh, has taken sort of these big picture ideas about women's reproductive health, uh, applied them to health communication campaigns, and messaging, and now we are, um, I'm very fortunate and, and um, thrilled to be working with the Center for Tech Health uh, and Healthy You to actually be testing some of these ideas and seeing if they can work um, on a bigger scale. So, how did I do on time? A few minutes for questions, not too bad. Um, if anyone is interested, I do have coupons um, for 30% uh, off, I think, for the book. So if anyone is interested, uh, please come see me after, and I uh, would be happy to give those to you. But now I'd love to take any questions that you have. Um, so, uh, so an allergy, well, there's two types types of IUDs. So there's a hormonal IUD, um, which is, you know, plastic. Um, so if the allergy was to, horm if you're talking about like a, hor a hormone sensitivity, uh, you also could go with a non-hormonal IUD, which is copper. So there are two different types of IUDs. So hopefully, um, actually for many women who can't use the pill or have sensitivity to estrogen, um, the non-hormonal IUD is, is a great option. So that, so I, usually when I hear about allergies, it's people who can't use the pill and then and they're wondering if they can use the IUD because there is a hormonal and non-hormonal option. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, one thing that they mentioned a lot was um, the what at the hospital I was working at, it was called the warm line, but many hospitals have this. So a telephone line where people can call in and get information. Um, you know, today uh, at MUSC, they have taken the, the traditional warm line and now have a telehealth line where women are actually, you know, able to do, to do that uh, call uh, with some video. So, which is a huge improvement because um, women uh, previously would be using the warm line. YouTube was a big way that they would get information um, and being able to, to look at information on YouTube. Um, and then the apps, of course. Um, but a lot of times that wasn't enough. You know, they needed someone to actually look at that latch and tell them what the problem was. And so, um, the, you know, they would have to go somewhere, whether that was, you know, a breastfeeding center or whether that was back to their provider. Um, and so now telehealth has really opened up immense opportunities. So you can actually, you know, from the comfort of your living room have someone looking at the latch and saying, oh, this is what might be wrong, and then, you know, providing recommendation for follow-up. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. 
the biggest concern I think during pregnancy was not necessarily what you what you would think. So um, scholars have talked about pregnancy as a body episode in which women can sort of relax for the first time in their life. They don't have to uphold these standards of perfection and beauty, and they don't have to um, you know be be perfectly thin. Uh, and so it, for some women, it's an opportunity to relax. Um, for the women I talked with, what was really surprising was they would talk about their doctor telling them they didn't gain enough weight. And that was the biggest concern I saw during pregnancy was women saying, you know, I'm healthy, you know, I've gained enough weight, or, you know, my mom said she only gained this much weight with me. And so women feeling like, you know, I'm okay, uh, and doctors actually saying, no, you need to be gaining more weight. And, um, and that was the biggest, the biggest source of angst, I think, among pregnant women was this idea that their doctor was telling them, you're not gaining enough weight, and then, and then saying, no, I, I'm healthy, you know, the baby's doing great, there's no symptoms, no signs, you know, but that push to gain more weight. I definitely investigate women's reproductive health, but um, especially with, with the HPV work that we've been doing, we found that including men in the conversation, whether that's contraception or pregnancy, or especially childbirth, is, is hugely important. Um, and I think you know, my recommendation for an app during labor and delivery um, absolutely in, includes men and, and their preferences, and, uh, especially as partners. Um, and when we, we find that women during labor and delivery have the most successful outcomes when they have uh, consistency of care and they have support and that support person is, is often the partner um, who is often a man. So I, I absolutely think we need to include men in this discussion and uh, they're, you know, in incorporate them in that work and that has definitely been one of our next steps trying to make sure that men are included. Um, so I really appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, two things. One, uh, women that I talked with really recognized national and also local names. So uh, women would be far more likely to trust a name that they perceived as credible. Um, so for example, what that translates to is women being more likely to take rep recommendations from WebMD versus, you know, a blog where it's just one individual giving their opinion. Um, so I think that national name recognition and local name recognition, so for example, something coming from the University of South Carolina would be much more likely uh, for women to take that seriously. Uh, however, women are very astute at processing information. So uh, they, they ha really have a complex way of uh, evaluating information, much like if you think about what you do yourself. You know, you might first talk to your mom or talk to family and friends, then you may go on Google and search things out, but you're looking for a pattern and you're sort of taking some things with a grain of salt uh, and, and waiting to see patterns emerge, uh, and then perhaps, hopefully, bringing that information to a doctor to get a healthcare provider perspective. But yes, I mean, um, I would say that women are very astute about those things and they're not going to take information just from any, any app that's out there. Um, however, you know, when we think about contraceptive scare in particular, uh, those media messages uh, sometimes come from big outlets like Vanity Fair um, had an article uh, about you know, is like, I forget, it was a very sensationalized headline is, you know, is the new ring killing women or something, you know, so, uh, so we do have to be careful that the that the big outlets and the national names are getting the right information. I was really using purposive sampling to, so I wanted to talk with women who were in these unique body episodes that I was looking at. So uh, for the contraceptive use dynamics, I went right to um, the, the women who needed this the most, sort of the forgotten group, if you will, of contraceptive use, and those were college age women. Um, and so, you know, based on, uh, you know, the statistics showing that they are in the greatest need, I said, okay, let's go to them. Then uh, for pregnancy, uh, I talked with women who, any woman who was pregnant that would talk to me. So, uh, and then I would get, you know, referrals, so snowball sampling uh, from them to other women who were pregnant. 
Uh, so pregnancy was was pretty easy, actually. Uh, pregnant women were were very willing to talk to me about that. It just was once you could find you know a group of pregnant women uh, to to get access. Uh, then for the for childbirth and postpartum, uh, that was a little bit harder. So I partnered with um, Women and in Infants Hospital in Rhode Island, and I conducted interviews uh, with women right after delivery in the in the postpartum ward as well as up to two weeks after um, so uh, I would if women wanted to I would make an appointment with them while they were in the hospital and then follow up with them up to two weeks postpartum so I was able to do a lot of those interviews in the postpartum ward uh, and women who you know were not in a serious medical or health crisis so uh, but just the the regular postpartum floor at women in infant hospital uh, because that was the, the most challenging group to, to access. I think especially in, in for the second question, uh, I think text programming, you know, text-based programming like Text for Baby, I mean, I think that's a huge opportunity. Um, and that, you know, really, we can get to anyone with that, uh, with text-based programs. And more and more women are really comfortable with that because they get texts from their doctors and their dentists and from schools. So they're, they're happy to get text messages. And women that I talked with said, you know, I like getting a text, I can forward it on, I can share it with my sister, I can share it with people who also might need that information. So I think, you know, mobile apps might be a gold standard, but I think we should not overlook other other things like text-based programming, um, which, is, which is really universal, and we can access anyone with that. So I think that's a, a really good question. And then in terms of the differences, so since I moved to South Carolina, I've done um, interviews with college-age women as well as um, adult women ages 18 to 44 uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, as well as in the rural low country. Um, and I, I will tell you that the differences are not as surprising as, as you might think. Um, well, first of all, some of my work was done in Rhode Island, which is the most Catholic state in the union. <laughs> so there are similarities not only in um, uh, some of those cultural factors, but also in the legislative agenda and those kinds of things. So the differences are not as great um, a as you might think uh, originally. But yes, I think, you know, I'm very committed to doing local work and finding out, you know, what do women in South Carolina think? Because uh, when I talk with, with local organizations, I think one of the biggest challenges is getting getting those materials from Washington, D.C. and the national outlets and saying those don't resonate with women here. So it's just so important to really understand and have that, that local, where some of the big picture culture might be the same, it's really honing in on those culture and social norms um, that really differ by location. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody about books or talking more with Dr. Sandstrom? Please come on up and thanks for coming.